So, 2016, I told everybody in uh, January of 2016 that it was going to be the year of the investor. It would be one of the most stable, best years in the history uh, for people who really knew what they were doing because if you got in the way of a transaction, you would be able to make money with it in 2016. So, 2017, it really is, did we get what we want? As the old saying is, sometimes we get what we want, sometimes we get what we need, but God help us if we ever get what we deserve. So, what did Trump say, President-elect Trump say, when he was on the campaign? Immigration reform. He's for job creation. Stop the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Reduce government regulations, especially on energy and the environment. We're going to have a strong national defense. Nobody's going to want to threaten the United States, as Donald Trump said. We're going to have, and he said it numerous times, we're going to have strong cyber defense so our country cannot be hacked by any overseas power. He said it many times on the campaign trail. He believes in strong constitutional Supreme Court justices, which effectively means everything's going to the states. What is government regulation today is going to be deregulated from the government, and it's going to go to states to, to handle the way it was originally designed in the Constitution if he gets two Supreme Court justices. And then he's going to have ethics reform, and he called it drain the swamp. We're going to change the way Washington works, right? So that's what he said. And then, how many people have seen the video that he did, uh, or saw the video that he did um, on the uh, 21st of uh, November, two weeks, after, two weeks after the election? Have you watched the video? Two minutes and 36 seconds long. It's the first public announcement that he did. And he said um, that he is working with his transition team to put together the things that are going to be, the first things that are going to be done on the first part of day one of his presidency. And he says in the video, he's going to withdraw from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, just exactly as he said on the campaign trail. Uh, the number two thing is we're going to cancel restrictions for production of energy in America, specifically clean coal and shale. For each new regulation, two old regulations have to be canceled. This is all in the two-minute video, two minutes, 36 seconds. The Defense Department is going to be charged with a plan to protect America from all cyber attacks and other attacks of any type. On day one, that's what he's going to charge the Defense Department with. The Department of Labor is going to be given the responsibility of investigating visas and illegal immigrants as to why they should be in this country and if they overstay and are there, is the visa program undercutting wages of American workers. And he uh, is implementing, as he's already done with the people that he's hired, his ethics reform. Nobody gets to return to Washington as a lobbyist for five years after they've been employed in the Trump administration. So there's a lot of government people in the State Department who would like to be um, lobbyists, but probably will not get to be a lobbyist if they're employed during the Trump administration. It's going to have really wide-reaching effects on who gets to actually work in Washington. But the reason that this all gets to be important is that each of these things that he's done are just like that $500 million development that nobody knew about in Nashville, but it's still being built, right? So the people who do know about it, the people who are paying attention to it, are reacting and they're getting ahead of what's going on. So as investors, what, has, what do these issues have to do with us as real estate investors in East Tennessee. So the Trans-Pacific Partnership, that's not going to have, that, there's plus, pluses and minuses for that in, for East Tennessee. We've got some people who are heavy exporters uh, and are very involved in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, would be involved in how that would work and other people are going to benefit from not having been involved in that trade pact. So um, I, I view that as a neutral for most of us in East Tennessee. Reduce government regulations, energy, 
Rick Perry is nominated. These are all the nominees. Nobody's going to point about it. Out, it? So Rick Perry is the head of energy. Now, the reason that that's important, in case you don't remember, in 2012, didn't I forget this one? <laughs> so he is going to get rid of three departments. The one he couldn't remember, the Department of Energy, is now when he was running for president in 2012. So now he's been put in charge of a department that he could not, he liked it so little he couldn't remember the name of it when he was in the debate. So you can absolutely bet the Department of Energy is going to get a lot smaller. What, what happened? What, is there something in Knoxville that has to do with the Department of Energy? Yeah. The National Lab. There we go. Think about what happens to Oak Ridge if the Department of Energy is cut in half. What happens to West Knoxville, where a lot of the engineers live? The this is how we as investors begin to protect our assets and manage what's going forward because we saw what he said on the <laughs> when he was campaigning around America. We have seen what he has said in his first video that's going to happen in the first part of the first day. And when you think of what is the impact of day one to 100 of the Trump administration, people can say some of the stuff, he, he won't get anything done in 2018, maybe 2019, before it actually gets in, 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 uh, put into effect so it begins to change. I view those people as wrong. Because I think the changes that are going to occur in the first 100 days are going to be staggering. Staggering. So, if they go in and Rick Perry cuts out the Department of Energy, are they going to say nuclear? That'd be good. Trump likes nuclear. Be good. Trump's uh, daughter likes nuclear. She, she certainly has a clear connection, right? So, these are things that as an investor, and you're thinking about investing in Oak Ridge, or you're investing uh, on some property, you've got to think in terms of what does that actually mean on Trump's energy policy. But it's a certainty that it'll be a lot clearer in February or March, right? EPA. Scott Pruitt is the head of EPA. He's the Attorney General from Oklahoma. And I've got beside him, what, global warming? This is a guy who absolutely positively hates the EPA. He has sued the EPA hundreds of times and has led multi-state lawsuits against the EPA. So you can be with, I think, some certainty that the EPA as it exists today will be significantly smaller in 100 days after the election. Because if he is appointed as uh, the uh, Secretary for the um, Department of, in, um, of the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency. He has the ability to enact legislation by himself without any other government authority. And what happens is people can say you, these are all grouped together because all of these department heads have the ability to literally write budgets and regulations that impact their, their direct employees the day they are appointed. So we know that the first guy doesn't want the Department of Energy to exist, and more importantly, he doesn't want the agency below the two agencies below him to exist. So he's going to be pretty good friends with Pruitt, who doesn't want the EPA to exist, and he may, he may not have a lot of. Uh, but he likes the Department of Energy, so there may be a little stuff there because you know Oklahoma's big real estate. But then again, they're reducing the EPA regulations, so maybe it'll all be good. And then the Department of Education. Would the Department of Education be important to Knoxville, Tennessee? So we have a woman appointed to the head of the Department of Education. Again, Pruitt probably doesn't like it. Perry wants it to go away. And the woman who's been put in charge of it believes that there should be charter schools. There, there will be absolute state control of education. And there needs to be student loan reform, as in there are too many students who have loans. And the loan program needs to be reformed. So the University of Tennessee is expecting 5,000 new students and some volume of those new students are based on the fact that they think those students are going to be able to get student loans. But I'm going to say that Betty Voss probably, Betty Voss probably is going to say, well, let's rethink that. So what happens to housing that's focused on UT students going forward? Will there be this ever-increasing demand that people project? 
There might be. I'm not saying there won't be. But I'm saying these are things that we as investors need to really pay attention to. And, and so you, if you see something that is a really good buy, you need to be sure you understand how these problems could negatively impact an investment that you're going to be involved in. You may need more cash reserves. You may need to think in terms of that's a good buy, but I may have to hold it longer to sell it. I may not be able to sell it for what I want, right? Because we are, I am, you should make up your own opinions. My job is not to tell you how to think. Your job is to prove me wrong. The treasury guy, his number one thing is he hates the IRS. He hates the IRS. I mean, he's a, he's a guy that, he's, a Gold, he's another Goldman Sachs guy. Uh, but he, uh, and my general thought is somebody who has made hundreds of millions of dollars for the trading for their own account, and has acquired hundreds of millions of dollars, and he's gone through numerous IRS audits, and he's the guy that's handling the Trump IRS audit, or one of the people that's been involved in it. And he was the finance manager for the Trump campaign, so you can imagine what that's been like, right? You can say that the IRS is going to look different. The tax code is going to look different. So they are working on regulation for the tax code, not only to have their, the tax code that Trump um, proposed and what Ryan proposed in the, in the Republican budget, um, they're about 20% apart as to where these rates should eventually wind up and how they're going to be handled. But rates are going to be lower for sure. Long-term capital gains are going to be lower. So if you know somebody, Eric buys apartments. So um, Heidi buys apartments. So you've got somebody who has apartments and they want to uh, sell the apartments, but they've been a little hesitant. Well, you know, I, I don't want to pay the capital gains tax. You know, I don't really want to fool the 1031 exchange. I've got good cash flow out of what I got. Why do I sell? And next year, they're going to pay half as much capital gain, most likely. They're going to pay half as much capital gains tax as they paid this year. So maybe you can contract to buy them in January and close in September when everybody knows what the rates are going to be, right? But there's going to be clarity in 100 days because you're going to see these bills move. Commerce, Wilbur Ross. I know something about banking. Wilbur Ross owns banks. He bought bunches of banks over time. He's bought, he's bought good banks. He's bought bad banks. He's taken over foreclosed banks by the FDIC and turned them around. He knows the government regulations that are involving lending. And two things are happening. Uh, the Federal Reserve has two, has two seats available that are going to be able to be appointed. Uh, one is going to be a community banker, meaning you're a bank less than $5 billion in size, which, you know, there's several of those. In, the Home Federal would be the bank here in East Tennessee, for example. But there are no community bankers on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors today. So the Federal Reserve has the ability to be reshaped by the Department of Commerce because it will, they will also be able to look at um, the Dodd-Frank Act and how that is creating enormous regulation for banks and smaller banks. The Federal Reserve, the Dodd-Frank Act, Act and the regulations that are part of that are extremely onerous on smaller banks because it's a relatively fixed charge that you have to pay talented people to do difficult work to maintain the regulations and the cost of entry is X dollars for that talent. So whether you're, I'm just making the numbers up, or whether you're a big bank or a little bank, it's, let's say it costs you half a million dollars, that's easy for a $3 billion bank to absorb, but if you're a $100 million bank, it's hard to do, right? So if those regulations become less, then all banks are willing to loan more money. If they get rid of this Consumer Finance Protection Bureau, which I'm sure Wilbur Ross does not like, then you wind up with a situation that banks don't feel like they're going to be penalized to loan money to small home builders because it would be a speculative loan. So you're going to see banks' ability to become more aggressive begin to increase as the year goes along, right? So if you're having trouble borrowing money today, I like Samantha, I like the other bankers that are in here, but let me tell you something about bankers' money. It's all green, <laughs> right? It's all the same. So you find a good bank or somebody that understands lending and a bank that wants to begin to put money on the street. And if you've already got a relationship and you've already got the opportunity, then as the regulations lessen, 
the bank wants to loan you more money because you're already a proven commodity and they, it's a good place for them to put more money because you will pay it back. Um, national defense, Ge uh, General James Mattis, you talking to me? <laughs> Anybody that wants to take on Mattis a year from now, because I got a feeling he is a guy that is going to follow Trump's lead and Lockheed Martin is going to reduce the price of those fighter jets and they're going to do some kind of deal. We're going to give you, we're going to give you three if you pay for two. There's going to be, <laughs> there's going to be some trade going on, but Mattis is going to have a military that is prepared to do whatever it needs to do. And I am also positive about the fact that Anonymous, the hacking organization, has got some really brilliant hackers. Really brilliant hackers. Hard drive is getting ready to scan. Thank you. <laughs> um, the, um, is that Assange doing that? Is that Assange doing that? Good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I say, um, so spell the propaganda. So, as you're thinking in terms of uh, how the the opportunities come together, you got anonymous out there with all these hackers that are brilliant hackers. I personally would want Mr. Robot on my side. But you wind up with a situation where the United States government will begin to pay what it takes to have people that they do not know from somewhere else begin to start creating security grids that we cannot imagine. Once, you, once the United States government decides that they really want to pay them and not let the CIA do it, and we're just going to say, we're going to hire you. So I think what the way the internet works will be different a year from now, or two years from now. So, everybody good on this so far? Yep. Yep. Labor. Andy Pudster. Everybody know Andy Pudster? CK um, Foods, Hardee's, um, Carl's Jr. Carl's Jr. He's, he's got 14,000 employees, right? He knows something about minimum wage. He knows something about technology and fast food restaurants. He knows something about the incentivization of people to work more and produce more, right? So he doesn't believe that there should be a minimum wage. He believes people should be paid a competitive wage so that they can move their lives forward because he believes that the government should be less involved in providing subsidies so people will want to work more and they will show up on time and they will work when they, when they need to do the work and they'll, have, they'll be excited about being able to work rather than worry about whether they're going to lose their benefits or not and they, they can't show up for another hour of work. And these are public statements that he's made that you can find online yourself. So we're going to say that the minimum wage effort will not go forward. As far as the federal government is concerned, if Seattle Airport wants to raise the minimum wage, they can have at it. Right? The last one, HUD, Ben Carson. If I can make it, so can you. This is a guy who absolutely believes in self-determination and self-reliance. So what does that mean to us? Number one, the immigration reform. We've got people in charge, as we just pointed out, who believe in strong borders and national defense, and you've got someone who is in the Department of Labor, Husner, who believe that people who are in America should be working and you shouldn't employ illegal aliens. Right? So you wind up with a situation that if you currently rent property to someone who is Hispanic, there is a strong likelihood that they will become nervous renters. If they have a felony conviction, I will say with some certainty that a year from now they won't be in they won't be in the state of Tennessee for sure. But they probably will not be in the United States. If they have family that doesn't have a felony and they're being deported, where's the family going to go? What's the family going to do? So you wind up with a situation with the Hispanic population, and there's about 70,000 Hispanics in the greater Knox metro area. You wind up with a situation, about 6% of the total population in this area. Um, you wind up with a, a situation that it is an unknown impact on a certain percentage 
of rental housing that rents in general for $700 a month or less. So you wind up that that market, because we know these regulations are coming, we know this is happening, just like those people in Nashville should have known there was a $500 million development, we know that this wave of transformation is coming. How we either surf the wave or get drowned by it is our choice by how we pay attention to what's going on, right? So, if you're renting to the Hispanic population, that is going to be a stressed population. If you've got people who are working, they've, got, they've been here for 10 years, they're working to get a um, um, citizen card, a lot of things I think are going to work out really well for those people. But uh, if I was in a situation where I didn't know that I was going to be allowed to live somewhere and I didn't know what my options would be, I would be really hoarding money. I would be hoarding cash. I wouldn't want to pay my rent because it takes 90 days to get evicted. And I worry about 90 days from now after I've got 90 days worth of rent saved, right? I don't look for to do damage to property, and I'm not talking about that, but there, if you're nervous and you're worried, are you gonna pay your landlord, or are you gonna keep it so you, if you have to go somewhere else, you've got the money to go? So if you're renting to the people, you gotta think in terms of, do you, are you building as a landlord cash reserves to be able to withstand the fact that the tenants might be hoarding their cash going forward? Logical, make sense? Yeah. So the labor shortage is the one um, that um, we all need to pay attention to um, because the, the Hispanic population in general in East Tennessee is an extreme working population. You wind up in a situation that they do uh, work, they show up, they do the work, they want to get paid. Uh, in general, they, uh, it's not a problem. And in general, they will work for less than competitive employees because they work steadily and finish the job more quickly. So even if you may be paying them a little more for the job, right, where they may earn more money for the job, where another group won't take the work. But once you wind up with a situation where 2,000, 3,000 people leave East Tennessee, everything begins to change. Everything that you think about employees, everything you think about how you're going to employ somebody, you're going to pick the phone up, you're going to have somebody, you got any roofing crew. How many non-Hispanic roofing crews do you think there are in East Tennessee? I mean, I don't know any. I mean, I know some guys that are not Hispanic, but their entire crew is Hispanic, right? So cost is absolutely going to increase for labor. It is absolutely going to take longer to get a project done. If you've got vendors that you like now, be sure they like you. Right? Because if they don't, and you call them next year, you may, they may not be returning any phone calls. Right? What's the, what's the Gatlinburg rebuild going to do to all the labor currently? There'll be labor coming in from all over the United States. You got all these mega crews coming in from um, Ohio and Iowa and all the places that have natural disasters normally. Yeah. Those people are all mobilizing to come to Knoxville. And you've got all these big construction companies that and specialize in building apartments that are looking to bid on so projects. So it's going to be easier to get stuff done in Knoxville or harder? It, that, that won't have, what's going on in Gatlinburg in a general purpose for, for those of us that are in this room will have little or no impact. Um, there will be plenty of people in Knoxville who go to work in Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg to, to do the work and do the repairs. But overall, the labor that's involved in that will not be coming necessarily from Knoxville. Because there's a lot of labor available up there, right? But as, going back to the Hispanic, there, you've seen numerous articles in the paper about the Hispanic church that's up there and the number of Hispanic people that are worried about what's going to be going on. They don't have any place to rent. They're worried about being able to rent somewhere else. They can't afford what didn't burn. So you you're going to see this transition move forward where the Gallenberg issue may, you know, you'll know a lot more about what happens in Gallenberg and that whole area by June or July as you begin to weigh out what these other crews are coming in and how they're bidding and how the fire insurance money is being handled. Is that, so, that going to affect the rent? Is that going to be a 
like from Cobb County to Randall? These people got to go somewhere. Um, they're going to go somewhere, right? Yeah, but, they are. They're here for a couple of years, aren't they? They may or may not be, right? Mm -hmm. So they may decide that they want to move to uh, uh, Land of the Ozarks or Lake of the Ozarks or to another place to work. They may move to Florida, they may move to Atlanta, they may move somewhere else. But the situation is what's in Cock County that would want them to move because then all of a sudden you got, tra you got transportation expense that a working person has to pay that's hard to pay even if you got a cheaper rent and there's nowhere near enough housing available in Cock County 20 miles away to be able to feed that population of people who are displaced. So maybe there's an opportunity to put some rental product in. And this is the value um, trap that you get into. Maybe there's an opportunity to do something cheap in Cock County now to get some renters because you can buy something and rent it out and make more money than you could have previously because you've got this influx of renters. But once things begin to stabilize, will those renters stay in Cock County? You know, you're going to be left with a building up there that you can't rent out to the people who actually live in Cock County. So these are the things that as you begin to think through what happens on the next six months, it is going to be, as I say, staggeringly impressive to the changes that are going to occur. Again, I'm, we'll find out whether I'm right or wrong, right? So the second part is the HUD reform. Where will people live? Going back to Brian's point, where will people live? Ben Carson in, in HUD absolutely believes that the overall HUD programs should be less. Donald Trump, who has so far proven to do exactly what he said he was going to do, believes that uh, domestic programs should be reduced so that the military budget can be increased. Right? So it's a guaranteed certainty that HUD is the largest component outside of Medicare and Medicaid of the federal budget it's going to have a lot less budget next year than it had this year. So all of the programs of HUD are going to be reduced. It won't make any difference what they are. The ones that generally affect us are the Section 8 tenants because they are the tenants that are in that same thousand to uh, six hundred to a thousand dollar rent range. There are four thousand Section 8 vouchers in the city of Knoxville. It's about depending on how you want to do that math as to what those, what those units would be worth, but they're certainly worth between uh, $50,000 and $60,000 per unit for that voucher. So the math $600 voucher. So you can say that there's about $200 million of property values owned by private citizens in Knoxville that all of a sudden may not have tenants. So you could have properties that don't have any Hispanic population that wants to move in because they're leaving and those buildings have empty spaces and your Section 8 tenant, their voucher has gone down and they can no longer pay the rent that they've signed the lease for. Right? Maybe they'll pay it to the end of the lease because they're going to be required to, but after that lease is uh, paid up, it's not going to get renewed. So this is something that we know with some certainty is going to happen. So if you've got a Section 8 tenant now, you need to be thinking in terms of these people don't like Section 8. There's going to be less money coming in for Section 8. We need to plan to have a little more cash. We need to be in touch with our um, tenant. Do we need to help them find a part-time job? Because one of the requirements is that they're going to have tougher standards for public housing. So I've got to believe they're going to have for Section 8 too. The Obama administration came out with a whole bunch of re regulations earlier this year for public housing, one of which was no smoking. Has anybody ever been to a public housing complex? <laughs> I don't know how they enforce that. I'm sure there's some way that you do that, but that's one of the Obama regulations that local housing authorities have problem enforcing. I can assure you that it won't make any difference to the to Ben Carson uh, as the new head of uh, HUD because he he believes that everybody in that section in, in the public housing property should have a limited time of stay on public housing. So in Knoxville, we have people that are in their third generation of living in public housing. That appears to go away under Ben Carson. And again, things with Carson, there, there's a lot of government budget involved. There's con congressional action that's required to do a lot of things 
with HUD and HUD financing. So all of the changes that are going to occur with HUD won't be instantaneous as they can do with some of the other departments. But Carson has budget authority to say that we're no longer going to fund, we're no longer going to request money for this section, for this section, for that project. And when you start saying that people can't live in public housing but for three or five years at a time, and they've got to work, and they've got to find a job, it changes the labor quotient. So will the people who live in public housing now, will they begin to take the jobs that the Hispanic, that the, I shouldn't say Hispanic, but the alien, people of foreign birth who are in this country illegally who have a felony? Is that broad enough? Is that really correct enough? <laughs> Who most likely, with the people that are in charge of defense in this country, will not be here in a year, right? You're going to wind up with a situation then that we don't know where the labor is coming from, but we do know there's going to be an incentive for people to work that hasn't existed in government programs in 35 or 40 years. That's, that is definitely in the pipeline of what's coming. And whether it gets done or not, we'll all find out together. I'm making the projections. So the third one which affects us directly is that we know interest rates are going to go up. 100% certain. They're going to go up uh, in next Thursday or Friday this week, whenever the meeting is this week. They're going to go up uh, probably an eighth or a quarter of a point, probably a quarter of a point. I think they'll go up three to four times next year. Some other people are saying they're going to go up one time. I think they'll go up three to four times, whether it's an eighth or a quarter. The Fed is already behind the energy of the economy by people who work for a living, who have an optimistic view of what is going to be done with this economy. They're buying into the idea that they're going to be paying less in taxes, they're going to be working more, they're going to have more opportunity to generate more money, and they're spending more money now. They revised this Christmas spend projection twice since Trump's been elected. Before he was elected, the Christmas spend was going to be a half a percent above 2015. The week after he's elected, it's one and a half percent above. Last week, it's four and a half percent above what the last year's spend was. So you look at what's going on, and we know that the Fed is going to try to at least control the growth of the money, but we have government regulation going down on banking. We have the opportunity for banks to lend more. We have issues which are coming along with tenant and tenant mix, right? So we get into that value trap again of we're being offered this money that looks like a good buy and we're not paying attention to what's really going on around us. You've got a kid who lives with, you bought a property in Chilhowee Hills, you're doing a flip, you want to sell to somebody who wants to live in Chilhowee Hills, and by the way, there are a lot of uh, young couples moving into Chilhowee Hills uh, because they've gotten really involved in that Houston Middle School. And they bought property, property values are increasing in Chilhowee Hills, but now Houston Middle School is going to go to 450 employees next year, uh, students next year, mm -hmm. and they've got to rezone six other schools or close Houston Middle School. Right? So right now today, you do not know whether Houston Middle School will exist or not in 2018. So all of a sudden, buying a house in Holston Hills to do a flip is a little bit uncertain. But if you know that interest rates are going to go up, and that's a price-sensitive market for younger couples to buy a home in, and rates go up two points, all of a sudden, you're, the margin on your flip is because it costs more money for them to make a payment because the rate goes up. The margin on your flip goes down because you, can't, you, know, you, you bought it at a number, you repaired it at a number, now, if Kyle's doing the work, Kyle will say, I'll work for less so you can make more money. <laughs> <laughs> so you wind up with a situation that you know for sure 
but that's a dangerous combination unless you've got capital or some partners who will put the money in if you have to own the property for another 60 days another 90 days or you have to take less of a profit than you anticipate taking right this, this is the reason i'm saying it's the best of times it is the worst of times it's going to be really hard for people to think in terms of, in our market, we have all this opportunity. All these unbelievably positive things can go on in our market. And over the next 90 days, as we find out who gets confirmed as the head of a particular department, as we find out what the, budget, the Trump budget looks like compared to the Ryan budget and how that's going to get worked out in Congress, we look at how these changes are going to occur and we can begin to get a focus on what we're doing here. So the thought process I really encourage everybody to make as we move forward into 2017 is to begin to think in terms of being more prudent. Be particular on the investments that you choose and why you choose them. Because it could turn out to be an unbelievable opportunity on the high side at the same time, I don't think you're going to make a bad investment in East Tennessee, by the way. I don't think it's possible. But I think you can certainly make a neutral investment or one that doesn't get you all your money back. You may burn your hand a little bit, but you're not going to cut your arm off. Right? I think the overall strength of East Tennessee is just too much. So, but for, the, for us as individuals, picking and choosing which neighborhoods we go to, why we're going to that neighborhood, that needs to be where the value is created. 